Well, good morning and blessed Lord's Day to all of our Refuge family and anybody else that's tuning in right now. Wonderful to see you, if only virtually. I'm Ben Keller, one of our elders here at Refuge Church and also the worship director, and I'm honored and pleased to bring you today's message. This last Monday, we celebrated Memorial Day, obviously a national holiday where we pause appropriately and uh, give due contemplation and appreciation to those who have sacrificed their lives on the altar of freedom for our country. And similarly, there are those occasions where we pause and celebrate the military heroes among us who are living, those who are alive and well. And I remember one of those occasions um, indelibly. It was kind of imprinted on my brain. It was May 10th, 2003. And we were living in downtown Everett at the time, myself and Dora and the, the wee kids. And we walked from our home on Colby down to the corner of Colby and California, which would give us a great vantage point for a parade, a parade that was going on celebrating all the men and women coming back to Naval Station Everett who had been on the USS Abraham Lincoln aircraft carrier. So it had just returned from a trip overseas serving in combat and supporting in a combat role in the war on terror. That war had begun uh, with American and allied forces, as you recall, fighting in Afghanistan, and then that moved to Iraq. Now this was 2003, just a year and a half removed from September 11, 2001. So patriotism was still riding high. It was a wonderful moment for that parade to publicly honor those who had served nobly. And uh, it was just a wonderful day, bright, sunny, and uh, much cheering. But as you know, it's no secret, uh, errors of intelligence, and mission creep and outgoing and incoming presidential administrations. All of those things served to complicate and extend our military commitment overseas in the war on terror. And America and her allies, and certainly her service members, felt the fatigue of diminishing returns. And as confusion about our mission seemed to fester, frustration and impatience with its scope and seemingly endless timeline increased. And today in Malachi, we're going to encounter something very similar as we begin another book of the Bible, another minor prophet of the Old Testament. So one Bible scholar explains it this way. He says, Malachi appeared on the scene at a time when the euphoria of the post-exilic Jewish community, that is the Jews that had returned from Babylon, following the rebuilding of the temple and the restoration of social and political life was beginning to give way to cynicism in both the sacred and secular arenas. And you saw that echoed in the Bible Project video, their excellent summary, which we showed before earlier in today's service. So that's where we're at as we begin today's text. Malachi is comprised of six disputations. And today we tackle the first. James will be preaching the remaining five in the coming weeks. And they're going to confront us with challenging topics, topics like judgment, divorce, finances, treatment of foreigners, as the Israelites are once again forgetting or choosing not to remember what God has revealed to them about true and good worship of him. And so the Lord has sent Malachi on a mission to sharply rebuke and reprove the Israelites. And while the first of, this, of these six disputations 
is relatively short, only five verses. Today's text may, in fact, present us with what some might consider the most challenging topic of all. Let's listen to the word of the Lord. The Oracle of the Word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, says the Lord, but you say, how have you loved us? Is not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. I have laid waste his hill country and left his heritage to jackals of the desert. If Edom says, we are shattered, but we will rebuild the ruins, the Lord of hosts says, they may build, but I will tear down and they will be called the wicked country and the people with whom the Lord is angry forever. Your own eyes shall see this and you shall say, great is the Lord beyond the border of Israel. May God bless the reading of his word. Tilting at windmills is an expression originating from Cervantes' Don Quixote 400 years ago, and it means attacking imaginary enemies. As I said, in many ways, Malachi's first disputation is the most difficult of them all. And the reason for that is that it is the windmill against which many Christians find themselves tilting at one point or another. And that windmill is the doctrine of election. That is the teaching all through scripture that God's choice of who he will save and who he will leave in their sins to be damned is free, merciful, sovereign, mysterious, true, and righteous. How do we know that the beginning of Malachi is about election? Isn't it just talking about land and boundaries and heritage? And what does Edom have to do with Esau? Let's get there, but let's hit the rewind button for just a second. Go back to Genesis chapter 25 verses 19 through 26. These are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham fathered Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah to be his wife. And Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his prayer, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. The children struggled together within her, and she said, if it is thus, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. The older shall serve the younger. When her days to give birth were completed, behold, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy cloak, so they called his name Esau. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand holding Esau's heel, so his name was called Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. And then from there, we go on to the account of Jacob taking Esau's birthright in exchange for some food. And Rebekah conniving with Jacob to disguise himself as Esau, to deprive Esau of his birthright by fooling his father Isaac. And that paved the way for years and years of enmity and discord and distance between Jacob and Esau. And although they had a dramatic reunion later in life, the fact remains that many of the people who were from Esau, from his line, became a thorn and remained a thorn 
and the descendants of Israel, rather Jacob's side, years and years and years later. Namely, we're talking about the Edomites, the descendants from Esau. So Edom bordered Israel in what is today southwestern Jordan. Very mountainous and inhospitable terrain. Sometimes people would leave, uh, live rather even in uh, the uh, caves, in walls. Petra, as you might recall, that famous uh, area is in the area once known as Edom, now southwestern Jordan. So in your Bibles, the minor prophet Obadiah has only one chapter, and you can read it in less than five minutes. If you want to know how God felt about the rebellious and conniving Edomites, the descendants of Esau, Obadiah makes it painfully clear. So this whole story is picked up in Malachi, in our passage today, where the prophet shows that it is not just physical separation and preference and national destinies that are involved, but spiritual destinies, namely election. Some people look at today's text and they say, well, that is just talking about national election, the destinies of the two people groups, the descendants of Jacob and the descendants of Esau. And that has always, I'll be honest, seemed a little strange to me as a way of trying to evade the force of election and a way to dodge that. They'll say, you see, this passage is only talking about groups of people. It's not talking about individual people. It's talking about groups made up of individual people. Okay. So one Bible commentator states well that it is freely admitted that the scriptures speak of the choice of nations to peculiar privileges and the choice of individuals to particular offices. All this is fully conceded. But yet there are passages which cannot, without unwarrantable violence, be interpreted in any other way than as teaching the doctrine of personal election to eternal life. I quote that because even if you think you've cleared the hurdle of today's text and can quickly skate past the first five verses of Malachi, a huge problem lurks on the horizon. And that problem is in the form of the Apostle Paul who has a pen, and he's not afraid to use it. Paul's letter to the Roman church in chapter 9 cements the scriptural case that Malachi is referring to election because Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, expounds on today's text in his letter to the believers there in Rome in order to drive home the very point of election. And as I mentioned in my sermon on Joel chapter 2, we need to pay attention when a pass from the Old Testament is caught and interpreted by the New Testament because it helps us to understand both. So first I'm going to read Romans 9, 6 through 24, slowly. I developed an outline to show you just how aggressive and clear Paul's case is. He's laying it out just like a skilled attorney. Then I'm going to read through it regularly. And you can determine for yourself if I've been fair to the warp and woof of the whole passage. So first, the outline. The Old Testament support for election using the example of Jacob and Esau. But it is not as though the word of God has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring, but through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. For this is what the promise said, about this time next year, I will return and Sarah shall have a son. 
And not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, now here's election is predicated on unmerited mercy, part one. Though they were not yet born, election is predicated on unmerited mercy, part two. And had done nothing good or bad, election is about God's purposes, not man's, part one. In order that God's purpose of election might continue, election is predicated on unmerited mercy, part three. Not because of works, but because of him who calls. Old Testament support part one, Genesis. She was told the older will serve the younger. Old Testament support part two, Malachi. As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Anticipating objections, part one. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. Old Testament support, part three, Exodus. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. Election is predicated on unmerited mercy, part four. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. Old Testament support, part four. Exodus, for the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Election is predicated on unmerited mercy, part five. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills and he hardens whomever he wills. Anticipating objections, part two. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, why have you made me like this? And finally, election is about God's purposes, not man's, part two. Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles." Now that we've gone through it that way, sit back and just let the text roll over you again as I read it without any interruption, just as if we're reading our daily Bible devotions. Here we go. But it is not as though the word of God has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring, but through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. For this is what the promise said, about this time next year I will return, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls, she was told the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God, who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills and he hardens whomever he wills. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? 
for who can resist his will? But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. Is it any wonder that Paul so often fills his letters? Look at Ephesians 1, for example, with rapturous praise of God and of Christ because he sees all of this unmerited mercy. It's not just a fine doctrinal point. It gets at the core and the center of who we are and who God is. Providentially, today the Belgic Confession gave us an excellent definition of election. And I'm gonna buttress that today by going back to the Westminster Confession whose statement on it is eloquent and precise, and uh, it's not overly long, but it's long enough, and it's humble, and it's helpful. And it's helped folks for several hundred years now to wrap their minds around it. Remember, this is a group of several dozen godly men getting together for uh, regularly for a space of forty-five, four to five years uh, with the purpose of trying to express as well and as accurately as we can, foundational truths of Christianity, but not going further than scripture would have us go. A very important job and they did a wonderful job at it. So this is from chapter three of the Westminster Confession of Faith. From all eternity and by the completely wise and holy purpose of his own will, God has freely and unchangeably ordained whatever happens. This ordainment does not mean, however, that God is the author of sin. He is not. That he represses the will of his created beings or that he takes away the freedom or contingency of secondary causes. Rather, the will of created beings and the freedom and contingency of secondary causes are established by him. Although God knows whatever may or can happen under all possible circumstances, he has not ordered anything because he foresaw it in the future as something which would happen under such circumstances. In order to manifest his glory, God has ordered that some men and angels should be predestined to ever everlasting life and that others should be foreordained to everlasting death. This predestination and foreordination of angels and men are precise and unchangeable. The number and identity of angels and men in each group are certain, definite, and unalterable. Before the creation of the world, according to his eternal, unchangeable plan, and the hidden purpose and good pleasure of his will, God has chosen in Christ those of mankind who are predestined to life and to everlasting glory. He has done this solely out of his own mercy and love and completely to the praise of his wonderful grace. This choice was completely independent of his foreknowledge of how his created beings would be or act. Neither their faith nor good works nor perseverance had any part in influencing his selection. Just as God has determined that the elect shall be glorified, so too, in the eternal and completely free purpose of his will, he has foreordained all the means by which that election is accomplished. And so, those who are chosen, having fallen in Adam, are redeemed by Christ. They are effectually called to faith in Christ by his Spirit working in them at the right time. And they are justified, adopted, sanctified, 
and kept by his power through faith unto salvation. Only the elect and no others are redeemed by Christ, effectually called, justified, adopted, sanctified, and saved. According to the hidden purpose of his own will, by which he offers or withholds mercy at his pleasure, and for the glory of his sovereign power over his creatures, it pleased God not to call the rest of mankind, and to ordain them to dishonor and wrath for their sin, to the praise of his glorious justice. This important and mysterious doctrine of predestination must be treated with special discretion and care, so that, paying attention to and obeying the will of God revealed in his word, men may be assured that they have been eternally chosen from the certainty of their effectual calling. In this way, the doctrine of predestination will elicit not only our praise, reverence, and admiration for God, but also a humble and diligent life, fully supporting everyone who sincerely obeys the gospel. So, some important things to remember. The Bible doesn't teach election so that Christians can gloat. The Bible, the Bible teaches election so that Christians will humbly worship their God and adore him. God doesn't tell us who the elect are. The number of the elect is known only to God. Our job is to profligately, widely, in every corner of the globe, share the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. The rest is up to God. We implore men and women to turn to Christ. We tell them it's their duty to return to Christ. It is not a request to repent. It is an order. You need to repent. You need to come to Christ. That is our job. The rest is up to God. The purpose of the doctrine of election is to provide for Christians an accurate game film, if you will, of their salvation and hope. And the Bible spends time talking about it, fairly significant amount of time talking about it, because it's one of the most clear and startling evidences of how undeniable God's mercy is, and consequently brings forth from God's children humble praise, adoration, and reverence. Holding, as I do, said the great 19th century Scottish minister and scholar, Alexander Grossert, that the theology of Augustine and John Calvin is the grandest, as well as truest, interpretation of the doctrines of the Bible, I believe, with all my heart and soul and conscience, the Apostle Paul's teaching concerning election, predestination, sovereignty, and substitution. I consider these mighty truths to be no less necessary to the plan of redemption than are the correspondent laws of gravitation that gird and grasp the physical universe to it. To my mind, refuse to God election, predestination, supreme sovereignty, and salvation, which is in the beginning and the middle and the end, holy of his grace, and you ungod God in the famous phrase of Jonathan Edwards. You may as well, Grosser continues, try to get the law of gravitation out of the universe as election out of the Bible. But what I must maintain with most intense belief is that in taking his stand upon these doctrines as the very truth of God, as penetrating the whole Bible in Old and New Testament alike, the minister of the gospel who would rightly discharge his office must proclaim 
that in no wise do they hamper or hinder the universal offer of a present salvation to every man who will take it from the Lord Jesus Christ on his own gracious terms. Indeed, that election, predestination, sovereignty, substitution, and the like are harmonized in the divine plan with the personal responsibility of every man who refuses such offered salvation. Let's talk about the character of God. So too often Christians butt up against a doctrine like this and effectively they put God on the witness stand. They say, hey, you have to answer to me on this. R.C. Sproul, who was one of the most gifted Bible teachers of the last 50 years, was that way. Uh, God reached in and saved him powerfully his freshman year of college. And in the beginning of his Christian walk, he fought these doctrines tooth and nail. And he was forced to confront the power of Romans 9 in his Bible studies, as well as the, as the works of Jonathan Edwards, and he couldn't get around it. He said, I surrender, unconditional surrender. But to help those of us who maybe were stubborn, maybe were questioning, or maybe you just need a theological booster shot, let's be reminded about the character of the God we serve. Now, if we didn't have a sin problem, we wouldn't need to go over these references in Scripture. But since our sin makes us prone as pots to judge the potter, we need to be reminded of what God's word testifies with respect to God's character. So first, we need to get cemented in our mind. God is perfectly just. Proverbs 11, a false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. Romans 3, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Psalm 146, who executes justice for the oppressed? Who gives food to the hungry? The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the sojourners. He upholds the widow and the fatherless. But the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. Isaiah 61. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrong. I will faithfully give them their recompense and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Isaiah 30, therefore the Lord waits to be gracious to you and therefore he exalts himself to show mercy to you. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are those who wait for him. Job 34, therefore hear me, you men of understanding, far be it from God that he should do wickedness and from the Almighty that he should do wrong. For according to the work of a man, he will repay him. And according to his ways, he will make it befall him. Of a truth, God will not do wickedly. And the Almighty will not pervert justice. Deuteronomy 32. The rock, his work is perfect. For all his ways are justice. A God of faithfulness and without iniquity just and upright is he. Psalm 9. But the Lord sits enthroned forever. He has established his throne for justice, and he judges the world with righteousness. He judges the peoples with uprightness. And secondly, a few more references. God is without sin. So God is just, perfectly just. 
In fact, he is justice. And God is without sin. Numbers 23, God is not man that he should lie or a son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said and will he not do it? Or has he spoken and will he not fulfill it? Second Samuel, this God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for all those who take refuge in him. For who is God but the Lord? And who is a rock? Accept our God. First John 1. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. First John 3. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins and in him there is no sin. And Second Corinthians 5. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The reason I love the doctrines of grace, which are sometimes referred to broadly as Reformed theology or Calvinism, is that they take the Bible as it is, not as we might want it to be. There are other systems of theology that appeal more to my flesh. And I also realize that the majority of Christians, majority of my brothers and sisters in Christ, if they subscribe to a system of theology at all, don't subscribe to reform theology. I understand. At one point, I didn't either. But I would lovingly exhort all of you to let the Bible be the Bible. Let Malachi 1 be Malachi 1. Let Romans 9 be Romans 9. Let the character of God be what it is for our good and his glory. You know, some hear the name Calvin and alarm, alarm bells go off, right? John Calvin, isn't he the cold logician, the tyrant of Geneva? That's what I've heard about Calvin. No, that's the Calvin of caricature. That's not a Calvin that I know or recognize from history. The Calvin I know is the Calvin of history. The Calvin that I know in history, faithfully taught the Bible until he had to be physically carried to the church to do so. He was so dedicated. The Calvin that I know all throughout the weeks, multiple times a week, gave extemporaneous teaching sessions on the Bible, going through sections of scripture. Extemporaneous means no notes. He had three enterprising students who recognized the gold that they were hearing and started to write it down. His extemporaneous talks marching through scripture. Those notes that were compared back and forth and then published became the gold standard of Bible commentaries, his extemporaneous expositions. That's the Calvin I know. By the way, he didn't ask those three students to take those notes. They saw the value and started on their own initiative and 450 years of Bible scholarship owes them a debt of thanks. The Calvin that I know who died 456 years ago this week, left the city state of Geneva convulsed with grief at the death of their leader pastor. The Calvin that I know insisted on having an unmarked grave because he knew the human tendency in our hearts for idolatry. That's the Calvin I know. Having said that, I don't really care too much 
whether any of you becomes a fan of Calvin or designates yourself as a Calvinist, that's great, but that won't save you. What I do want you to know is Calvin's God. I do want you to know Calvin's Christ. Because if you knew God, and if you knew Christ, how Calvin did, your life would be upended. In his youth, Calvin was a smart scholar who wanted to be left alone. Leave me alone to my studies and my books. But God used his friend Pharrell to give Calvin a sanctified kick in the rear. It was in the early decades of the Reformation. And Pharrell says, you need to be in this fight. You need to be preaching the gospel. And a pox on you and your house. And may the Lord curse you if you don't. You can read about it. A tremendous experience that Calvin had this wake-up call from his friend saying, no, get into the fray, Calvin. God has called you for this purpose and this time. And then what happened? Calvin became the Michael Jordan of the Protestant reformers. Maybe some of you have seen that recent ESPN documentary, The Last Dance on Michael Jordan and the Chicago Bulls. That's what happened with Calvin. Calvin said, just like Jordan was the hardest worker on the Chicago Bulls, the Lord gifted Calvin with strength and encouragement. Calvin said, nobody's going to outstudy me. Nobody's going to outpreach me. Nobody's going to outorganize me as far as the church and bringing the light of God's word to the city state of Geneva. And it lit a fire that's lit to this day. And if that means they have to carry my broken and bleeding body to the pulpit, then so be it. And that is, in fact, what happened. Calvin let the scriptures be the scriptures. The scriptures that are so vividly captured in all those superlatives of Psalm 119. Calvin let God be God, a glorious, saving God. Our God is a God who saves, David says in Psalm 68. The sovereign Lord rescues us from death. That's Calvin's God. And here's the great Genevan on the glorious but difficult truth we're considering today. He says, the reason why the Lord treats some mercifully and exercises the rigor of his judgment towards others, we must leave to be known by him alone. For he, with very good intentions, has wished that it should be hidden from us all. The coarse insensitivity of our mind would not be able to bear such a great light, nor would our smallness be able to understand such great wisdom. In fact, all those who tr will try to rise to such a height, being unwilling to hold in check the foolhardiness of their spirit, will experience the truth of what Solomon says, that he who desires to investigate the majesty of God will be crushed by his glory. It is enough for us to have decided this in our hearts, that this dealing of the Lord, although hidden from us, is nonetheless holy and just. For if God wanted to ruin all humanity, he would have the right to do it. And in those whom he rescues from perdition, one can contemplate nothing but his sovereign goodness. Today's text is a love story. Really, it is. I want you to know something about me. Inside me is a heart that by all accounts should be the heart of Esau. Inside me is a heart that had every possibility of producing just as Esau did, a whole progeny of people who would reject and spurn God and his word and his people. Inside me 
is a heart that should be the heart of Pharaoh. Raging, blindly stubborn, so prideful that 10 plagues from a just God, a God who is justice itself, only cemented the rebellion inside. Crops, gone, livestock, dead, Nile, blood, firstborns, dead. That should be my heart. That should be my story. But the Lord loved Jacob. The Lord loved Jacob. And the Lord loved me. Before I was born, before I had done anything good or bad. And in the course of time, that electing love irresistibly and irrevocably reached in and regenerated my heart, just like the dry bones in Ezekiel, setting me on a path that according to Romans 8 and a whole host of other scriptures, my loving shepherd will not allow me to depart from. A path that will not and cannot fail to place me in right standing before the Father when it's my time to go or when Christ comes back, whichever comes first. So for those of you who are believers, and that's your story, that ought to give rise to a huge hallelujah. If you're not a believer, it can be your story too. If you don't know Christ, you can surrender in faith to him today. In fact, you need to surrender and repent today. Perhaps you don't understand everything I've shared today. That's okay. But maybe you've caught just a glimpse of this amazing God we serve and the amazing son he sent to save us. I hope you feel the truth of that pressing on your soul. That is my great prayer and wish that you turn to Christ today. And then one day you will look back at the game film of your conversion and you will see just as the Bible says in John six, what happened there? The father gave you to Christ and drew you towards him savingly. Today's passage is a cautionary tale. Yes, the Lord expressed hatred of Esau. That is a fearsome thing that should give us pause. What does that mean? Well, on the one hand, readers of scripture, they already know God hates, right? Psalm 5 tell us, tells us God hates evildoers. Isaiah 61 tells us God's, God hates robbery and wrongdoing. Zechariah 8 tells us God hates scheming and lying, lying rather. So number one, we know that God can hate. And number two, we know that when God hates, it is not to be understood as the sinful and vitriolic emotion that we talk about when we say human being unrighteously or sinfully hates. Yet, the force of Malachi requires an answer, doesn't it? What does it mean for God to say, Esau, I have hated? It means a hot, holy, directed displeasure aimed at Esau and his progeny. Now, some commentators over the course of history have tried to help the Lord out by blunting the edges of that verse. And they will say things like, look, when it says hate, it just means a lack of preference or loving less. It is true that we see Jesus using hatred hyperbolically in Luke 14, when he says, if anyone comes to me 
and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. So Christ there in Luke is obviously not telling us to sinfully hate our families, which would militate against the whole tone and tenor of his earthly ministry. But he is saying that your love for me must be so great that in comparison, if it were possible, your relationship to your family would look like hatred. I think we get that. We can walk and chew gum at the same time and understand what Jesus is saying there. But I think it's highly unlikely that Esau experienced God's hatred hyperbolically or as a lack of preference or as loving less. I think it's far more likely that he experienced that hatred as the hounds of heaven breathing down his stiff neck and breathing down the neck of his descendants, his sinful and rebellious descendants. So the cautionary tale from today's text should stop us in our tracks and humble us. There's no question, it's not a little or a light thing for Esau or anyone else for that matter to be described in the Bible as an object of God's hatred, his holy hatred. But we must affirm what the scriptures tell us. The Lord ordains all that comes to pass. We must affirm what the scriptures tell us. The Lord ordains vessels of destruction, vessels ripe with their own nascent sin and rebellion. We must affirm what the scriptures tell us. The Lord ordains hardening of hearts, hearts already calcified by their own sin and the sin nature transmit, transmitted by our perfect and perfectly flawed first parents. And yet the Holy Scriptures are in complete agreement with the witness of the Holy Spirit in our hearts that in everything God ordains, every action God undertakes, there is no sin. There is rather complete righteousness and vindication of God's name and God's glory. But the cautionary tale is not the main melody of today's text. The cautionary tale is not its main heartbeat. Right in the middle of the second of the Ten Commandments recorded in Exodus chapter 20, the Lord says, I lay the sins of the parents upon their children the entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generations of those who reject me. But I lavish unfailing love for a thousand generations on those who love me and obey my commands. The main heartbeat of today's text is Jacob I have loved. Jacob, I have inexplicably, miraculously, mercifully loved. Jacob, who was prone to be deceitful? Yes. Jacob, who had that deceit repaid back to him by his corrupt father-in-law Laban? Yes. Jacob, who wrestled with God? Yes, Jacob, I have loved. John Newton wrote many hymns, most famously, Amazing Grace. And I'll give him the last word today from his song titled, Poor Esau Repented Too Late. And this is how it goes. Poor Esau repented too late that once he his birthright despised and sold for a morsel of meat what could not too highly be prized. How great was his anguish when told the blessing he sought to obtain was gone with the birthright he sold and none could recall it again. 
He stands as a warning to all, wherever the gospel shall come. O oh, hasten and yield to the call, while yet for repentance there's room. Your season will quickly be passed, then hear and obey it today, lest when you seek mercy at last, the Savior should frown you away. What is it the world can propose? A morsel of meat at the best. For this, are you willing to lose a share in the joys of the blessed? Its pleasures will speedily end. Its favor and praise are but breath. And what can its prophets befriend your soul in the moment of death? If Jesus for these you despise and sin to the Savior prefer, in vain your entreaties and cries when summoned to stand at his bar. How will you his presence abide? What anguish will torture your heart? The saints all enthroned by his side and you be compelled to depart. Too often, dear Savior, have I preferred some poor trifle to thee. How is it thou dost not deny the blessing and birthright to me? No better than Esau I am, though pardon and heaven be mine. To me belongs nothing but shame. The praise and the glory be thine. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I humbly ask that you bring the truth of your scripture to bear that the true weight of your glory would rest on all the saints listening to this and that your glory, which is always pursuing those you have called to yourself, would quicken those who don't know you who are in the sound of my voice. They would feel the first beatings of that regenerated heart that springs into faith because of your love and your unconditional election and mercy. We pray all these things in your name. Amen.